what got you involved in dogs in the first place? Uh, well, basically, I grew up with dogs. Uh, since I was born, I pretty much had dogs. I got pictures of me uh, one year old in the walker with game dogs in my face and all that because my, my uh, father and my uncle and one of their friends, they bred dogs and every weekend we would go to different um, dog events, dog shows, uh, go out of town to go see different dogs, uh, go to different uh, working events that was in the area or if it's somewhere out of state, but it's you know, just a couple of hours away, we just go to different um, dog stuff every weekend. So um, with me hanging around them, I got like real deep into the dogs. Uh, to the point where I wanted to start my own program. As I, as I'm growing up with them, and we getting different dogs. Like they had, pit, I, they started off with pit bulls. Uh, went to American Bulldogs. We had oldies, English Bulldogs, um, Rock Rollers, um, a lot of different dog breeds. So uh, we going out to all the different places, doing stuff with the dogs. So this one particular day, um, I went out with them. They already knew the guy, but this is the first time that I've been to his house. So it was this guy uh, named Richard K who stayed out here in Chicago. And he had, man, like all the big time breeds that you see today, like the Corsos, the Borbles and stuff like that. He had all those dogs back in, what was this, like 98, 98, 99. He was getting uh, Borbles imported from South Africa here. Uh, Pressors, Corsos, Tosas, everything that you Man, that you you see now, that's like popular breeds now. That back then, you, it, it was very little information on these dogs. So, not only he was getting dogs um, imported, he was doing few, pure, I mean, purebred um, breedings. But at the same time, he was crossing these dogs too. He had a Bourbon named Major that he that was an incredible, one of the best deals to this day, one of the best Bourbons I ever seen in my life. But he had this Bourbon, he was crossing this dog into. American Bulldogs, Rock Rollers, Corsos, and the outcome of these dogs was coming out incredible. They was healthy, they were big, they was athletic, um, the aggression was there, they was just nice all around dogs. So it really interested me into, I'm like, man, okay, I'm, I'm gonna um, look up research, you, and when you breed, you gotta do the research. With anything that you do with these dogs, because every dog breed got a job. Every dog was created with a purpose at the end of the day. I think a lot of people forget that when they get into these different dog breeds. Every dog breed is bred for a specific job. So when you get into these different dogs, you want to try to find a dog that fit that category, that standard, that, that type that the dog is supposed to be. Mm -hmm. So I started out, started getting all these different um, breeds. My uncle, like I say, he was breeding dogs and he was cross breeding as well around that time. So he had a, a boar bull that he got from Richard K and he was breeding game pit bulls. So he bred one of his game pit bulls into the boar bull and he had a litter, incredible litter, really nice working dogs, out uh, the whole nine. But because of, they, because of the pit bull, you know, when you breed pit bull into the masses, they bring the size down. So he wanted to breed the size back up some so we um, ran to this lady, Rashida, who was breeding the Polynesian Masters at the time, and we uh, used one of her male studs to breed into one of the females out the Borbo Pit uh, combo. Mm -hmm. So we did that. I ended up getting Colossus. My uncle ended up getting Grimlock. And, uh, you know, the other friends, whatever, like everybody pretty much got a dog. I took it to a total different level, though. I, Colossus was so good of a dog that I was like, I gotta keep this around. I wanna make this into something special that it, that even if he do pass away, I always got him here. So I took him um, and I want, and, and he was the perfect dog, but I wanted to raise the height on him. I wanted to give him more height because he was, he was shorter. He, he wasn't too short, he wasn't pit bull short, but as far as master wise, as far as, well, should I say what I wanted, he was too short for what I wanted. So I, I when I got a poor Sophie, man, she was a tall, uh, lengthy female. I can't exactly remember the bloodlines. I knew to remember that she was heavy on the Mike Satilli stuff, but I'm pretty sure that she had some other stuff in her too, but she was heavy on the Mike Satilli blood. She was a real nice blue brindle Corso. So I bred him to her, uh, got the first litter. Actually, that was the only litter because she was a terrible mama. <laughs> terrible, like she she killed half the litter. It, it took. It was like oh, man, sucks. hell and high water, just trying to keep the half of the other uh, puppies alive. So I ended up being. I kept. I kept six alive. I kept one. 
and then I kept the other ones close. Because at this point, I'm, I'm still living with my parents. I'm 16 years old at this point. So I don't have my own house or nothing like that. This is just me breeding at home. Mm-hmm. So um, I keep it up. I keep the other ones close because I'm going to use these dogs for future references. After that, I went and got a bull, uh, an English master. And I bred him to the English master to ensure the size. And um, this particular English master not, wasn't like the Angus masses that you see today. That's like lazy couch potatoes. They just big gigantic dogs that they ain't really they soft. They ain't really doing so much. This dog was completely different. Uh, mm-hmm. He was working. He was he was huge, of course, because he's English massive. But he had big time athleticism. He was he was be hanging from trees and all kind of stuff. That stuff that you don't even see your average English master doing. So I was like, okay, yeah, we I, we got to use this dog. Mm-hmm. So we we crossed him into that, got puppies, and then once I got um, I bred him into those, those two dogs. I kept um, pups from those, two, both of those litters, and then I bred those dogs together. And that was the beginning of how my colossal master breed started. So from there on, I'd line breed, inbreed, outcross when I needed to until I start getting consistency. Because at the end of the day, I wanted a, a, a family, a, a personal working uh, family dog. That's that's pretty much good for whatever you need this dog for. Um, if you uh, if you want to go jogging, this dog can go jogging with you. If you want to go hunting, you could go hunting with this dog. If you want to just want protection at the house, this dog is perfect for that. But also, it's great with kids and family and your friends that you get that that's at your house on a normal basis that you really spend time with. Now, when it comes to intruders and strange people, they are very uh protective they not gonna let anybody just walk up on you they ain't gonna just be willing to let anybody come in and let them pet them and stuff like that and they start showing that at an early age around four about three i would near i'd had uh, about three or four months you start really noticing the protection instinct in the puppies and then as they grow older they bond they real intelligent they they easy to train um, basic obedience, house training, cage training, the whole nine. They real intelligent dogs, and they show that at an early age. Well, you see a lot of puppies at a young age. They real immature. They playing around. They getting into everything. It's, right. it's, these, these are nothing like that. They real laid back. They really want to bond with you, because at the end of the day, when breeding dogs and just having dogs in general, having that bond with your dog is probably the most important thing that you can have. With that bond, that's 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 how you that's the that's how you make your dog work for you. At the end of the day, that right. dog know that you're his best friend, the protector, the person who feed him. And as long as you get that dog good energy, good vibes, that dog will return that same favor ten times stronger. That dog will die for you at the end of the day. So you definitely got to have a bond with these dogs um, growing up in order for the dog to really uh, be the best possible dog that the dog could be. You know what I'm saying? Um but at the end of the day, like I say, it's in general, it's a it's a well structured, uh well tempered, uh working master. That's exactly what they are. They they just big time working family, working dogs. You feel me? So now where where are you from? Chicago. Okay. Um so the Colossal Mastiff, that name originally came from that first dog? Yep, Colossus, yep. Okay. And how many generations in are you? Like, how many generations down from um, that first um, dog? I'm 10 generations in right now. Very nice. And how many dogs yeah. do you have? I have six at the moment. Okay. That's good. Mm-hmm. Three, I, three males, three females. That's cool. Yeah. Uh, I say when I, when I start a program, I, I want to keep it on the small side myself. Just so I yeah. can get that, just so I get that bond with each dog, you know. Exactly. I was just about to get to that. Yep, that's exactly what you need that bond for. When you get twenty do- dogs on a yard, it's hard to really spend time with every single dog on an everyday basis like that. Every dog ain't gonna get that same attention as the as the next dog because there's so many. When you get when you got a small amount of dogs, you could you could spend time with these dogs. Even if you did it a dog a day, I mean, a dog a day for a week. Every every week you spend in a day with each dog. That's way better than having 20 dogs on a yard that you can't really, you only, it, because at the end of the day, if you, so just to be honest and make sense, it's only, like I said, you only got so many hours in a day. Now, if right. you're a person that's all day in your yard, maybe that's something different if you don't have a job to go to, but you got jobs, you got kids, you got 
other things that you want to do so you don't have a lot of time in a day to spend with 20 different dogs so if you got a smaller number that you can actually spend time with get these dogs exactly how you want them to be um, bonded with you and actually put the time obedience working wise and stuff like that is a way better situation right now um so how much pit bull blood do you think is still left in your line um i percentage wise i would say I, maybe i'm thinking more like 15 to 20 percent okay so they're definitely mm -hmm. definitely more on the mastiff side yeah it's definitely more mastiff yeah how much do your dogs weigh on average um uh, males are about 150 to about one the the high biggest one i had is about 180 150 to 180 Holy females shit. are about one uh 120 to 140. wow so these dogs are mm -hmm. huge yeah they are they're huge but at the same time they're not sloppy unfunctional dogs they still move they could still jump over fences they can still jump in the back of the car they could still go chase down animals the whole night so like i say a lot of people think that because you breed big huge dogs that they lazy they can't do nothing and stuff but no it's just depending on the dogs that you use mm -hmm. and the eyesight that you got for your program if you if, if you breed for function you're gonna get function if you're breeding dogs that's not functional, that's exactly what you're going to get, lazy couch potato dogs. My whole program, see, my program is not really based off dog breeds. It's based off Colossus. It's based off, it's based off the dog. They heavy on the Colossus in him. That's why they call it the Colossus Master. They heavy on him. And he was a functional, uh, fit, intelligent, working dog. And, and every dog that I use in the program uh, complemented Colossus. They was pretty much the same dog as Colossus at the end of the day, as far as traits and everything else that I wanted to keep. I never used nothing that was lazy in the program. So I think that's one reason why these dogs uh, for so long just stayed big, of course, because they're so much massive, but the function never left because I never used dogs that didn't have it. Now you said Colossus was Borbul Pitbull? And Neapolitan Mastiff. And Neapolitan Mastiff. Now how much did he weigh? He's about 120. Okay. I got mm -hmm. you. Yeah. He's about 120. Uh, real nice, solid dog. He was probably, he had like a pit bull shape. Um, Neo is bone, not as heavy as a Neo, but way bigger than your average pit bull. It's probably in between, I say Neo and pit bull is bone wise, but very, very functional. Um, people wise, like I said, it was a perfect family dog, but he did not like strangers and he did not like animals at all and i guess the animal thing you know i guess that comes from the pit bull or whatever because you know they are real animal aggressive dogs so mm -hmm. i'm guessing that's what that and and, it's, and all those traits still stayed in these dogs 10 generations down the line the same traits that i started these dogs out with that i was so thirsty about to keep uh with colossus still carried on to this day every last dog act the same way pretty much at this point they all look in the same way i'm getting a consistent color in the litter um everybody size wise height wise is consistent so um at this at this point it's really starting to become a real consistent set type of uh breed or type however you want to say it right okay now when you say when you say 10 generations how many years are we talking i've been breeding for going on 17 years now so 17 years that's from colossus to now yep okay Mm -hmm. um do you do you know off the top of your head what bloodline of game dog was used yeah um rare rare boy um rare boy jocko okay um pretty much more rare boy than, than the jocko stuff but it was uh a combination of the both rare okay. boy and jocko mm -hmm. so what do you do with your dogs regularly like what is your daily what is your daily grind with your dogs um well you know you get up in the morning feed um clean and then i in i individually i take dogs out for uh walks um every weekend well I, i've been rehabbing my house so i ain't been doing it a lot this year but um i do a lot of protection work uh on weekends at my house because i got a long driveway so you could probably put about 20 dogs i'm guessing maybe uh down the driveway if you, you know what i'm saying got them changed up the right way and we used to do protection work over here every Saturday. 
So um, I was doing the protection thing with the dogs. I don't personally do the protection work. I got one of my friends who actually do it. I just, you know, I just got the dogs and I got the spot where we do it at. But uh, every weekend we was doing that. Um, I take them out to different uh, stores like Track Supply, uh, Most Feed, and different stores like that. So you know they get the um, socialization with with different people, and you know to get the different people to get to see them and you know advertise the brand a bit more at the same time. Um, what else? Uh, I would love to take one of them hog hunting but you know when i'm in chicago so i'm not in the area where we had hogs and i like that but i would love for somebody to get one who stay in the area where there is hogs and actually see what they do i would want, want them to see what they could do with a, a, a actually an animal that's going to try to fight back at the end of the day so that mm -hmm. would be something uh that i would love to see but for the most part like i said we just do basic everyday um uh, dog stuff that everybody else do with their dogs um i might be a little bit heavy on the protection side of it but for the most part it's just an everyday dog life thing that we right. do mm -hmm. so when you take them to places like tractor supply are they aggressive towards strangers or or do are they laid back because you're laid back um it just depends on which dog that i bring now every dog i won't bring a truck supply because i got some dogs that are offensive like that that won't let nobody walk up on them or me a point man clear period but i do have dogs over here that's a little bit more social that, that you could actually come and pet and they won't react that but all of them you know all of them pretty much know that when it's a situation when they need to react they will react I do have, like I said, I do have dogs that come off as, hold on, we only want to be by the point blank period. But at the same time, I got dogs that's, that's a little bit more social that you can come rub and pet and really get to know. But at the same time, those dogs still, if, if a situation came, they still react if they needed to. And that's something that nowadays that I'm trying to push more, I'm trying to get more dogs that's more social in that way. Because at the end of the day, I want to start bringing dog everybody out to the point where they could be fine in public and I ain't got to worry about the aggressiveness uh, mm -hmm. towards other people. That's, you know, in some situations and I call for, we just going to a store, I don't really need a dog to be trying to kill nobody because we just going to get dog food or we might just be going to check out the thing. So I just want, I'm trying to get dogs that's a little bit more social. And then, you know, that's just start with socializing um, young at the end of the day. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. and, and showing them what you want the dog to do and praising it every time the dog do a good job you know what I'm saying? When uh, good, doing good at whatever you want that dog to do. So that's something that I'm, as a breeder myself, I'm gonna do better <laughs> as far as that part. You actually registered the Colossal Mastiff as a breed, correct? Yep. What registry? Uh, what registry did that for you? Uh, the American Dog Federation. Uh, they had the FDS, ADF register and their foundation stock. Uh, registered through the American Dog Federation also. So what did you have to do to get that process going? Uh, you know, I had to get the paperwork from all the original dogs. Um, I had a written down pedigree from the beginning all the way up to now, so I had to submit that to them. Uh, they checked everything out to make sure everything was legit. I had to send pictures of the dogs, uh, a standard of the dogs to see if everybody fit the standard. And um, it took a little, it was a, no, it was a, it wasn't a long process, but it was a, a little process. And uh, after a while, once they got the pictures of the different dogs and start seeing the consistency in them, and um, they start rationing the dogs from there. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's really cool. Yeah, it is. I'm actually trying to get them registered through a couple of different other registries also. Uh, so that's something that I'm trying to get into. Let's see if they're registered the dogs. Um, at the end of the day, like I say, I feel like they consisted enough uh, that different registries, I, I think they would and, and kind of should mess with them. They, to me, they coming out a little bit more consistent than a lot of these um, purebred dogs that you kind of see today. Um, a lot of these purebred dogs nowadays are like all over the place, depending on the purebred dog that you're dealing with. Um, like you got Corsos, you could get five different people. It's that very tiny Corsos that you're going to get five different looking dogs five different yeah. things and stuff like that so i think my dogs are uh coming out a lot more consistent than a lot of these dogs that you see today do you think that the reason there's so much inconsistency in a lot of the mastiff breeds especially 
is because of working camps versus show camps? Yeah, I think that's a big part of it. Because a lot of people, you get a lot of people who, when they're looking for a dog, they want to say, oh, yeah, I want a working protection dog. Until they actually get a working protection dog and can't handle it. And then that dog is getting sold or going to the pound or stuff like that. Or they trying to find dogs to water the temperament down. I think that's a lot. That's what really happened with the Corso. Uh, the Corso, like I said, I've I, I seen the Corso back in what, 90, 97, 98. Back when it wasn't really too much information on these dogs. And uh, they were just an up-and-coming breed. Back then, those dogs was, were a totally different dog than what you see today. Look-wise, temperament-wise, the whole nine. Back then, those dogs literally looked like Lena working Neapolitan Masters. The dogs that you see today look like a little bit of everything. You, you get dogs that look like boxers. You get dogs that look like bull masters. You get dogs like Great Danes. You get dogs that look everything but Corso. And the temperament ain't there. They, 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 they soft now. You they got nerve issues. It's all kind of crazy stuff that's going on, but that's because people say that they want a certain thing until they actually get it and don't really know how to handle it. And that goes with doing research on these different dogs. If you do your research on a dog and you know about the dog and what this dog has to offer, then you have you you know what you're getting. Uh, you got a heads up about what you're getting before you go get it at the end of the day. It's not no confusion there. You know exactly what to look for. You know exactly what this dog is supposed to be. And that's what it's supposed to be about. You get, you get so many people, and, 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 it's, not, and, it's, it, it, and it's a lot of the breeders' fault because you get some people, and a lot of people, if you don't know what a dog is and what it's supposed to look like, you get so many people who don't even, ain't really even breeding Corsos. They got Corso box crosses. But if you don't know what a Corso is, he can lie to you and say, oh, yeah, this is 100% Corso, huh? Here go the parents. So, and, but if you don't really know what the dog supposed to be, you're going back. He might be selling dogs for two, three thousand dollars. You now you even spent two, three thousand dollars on a dog that's not even what you was, what you thought the dog was supposed to be. So mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's crazy. I remember that happened to us years ago. Mm -hmm. We uh, went out, uh, I forgot the, uh, the breeder that we got the Corso from. But we went out, uh, tried without a sound, went to go pick the dogs up. Pick the dog up, should I say, it was only one dog we got. Parents was real nice. Super nice, working, uh, everything that you would expect the Corso to be. They, they had the little, the little came out nice, we got the dog. As the dog was growing up, you know what this dog turned out to be? A tall boxer. Looked just like a boxer. Nothing Corso-ish about this dog. So it, it's just a matter of doing your research and knowing what you want, and knowing and 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 and, and knowing what to look for uh, with these different breeders, because at the end of the day, uh, nowadays with the dog breeding game, it's about the money. People not really too honest about uh, what they really got or what they really breeding. If 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 it's, if the color nice, if the dog big, oh yeah, I could sell it for fifteen hundred or more. And 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 at the end of the day, the crazy part is you got people out here that's gonna buy. So I suggest to people out there, do your research on these different breeds, do your research on these breeders. If the if, when you go into these different breeders' house, if they only got two dogs, you want to see the, the background, you want to see the parents, you want to see some offspring, or some, some line, some family tree to let you know what you're getting, what this dog is going to be at the end of the day. And then you get a lot of people. Nowadays, like this dog game now is totally different from when I was growing up. You get a lot of people who just bat dogs straight off Facebook and won't even visit the yard. Mm -hmm. They see pictures on, they just see the picture and be like, oh yeah, I want it, huh? How much you want, 2,500? Okay, here you go. Don't even go, go to the yard, check the dogs out, just going straight off the picture. So me, I need to know a little bit more than that. I need to, I need to see a family tree. Um, I want the paperwork is fine at the end of the day. Because, I mean, it's just a bunch of names, and sometimes you can look up and see what the dog is. But I want to see what's there in front of me. I want to see what these dogs produce. I want to see what these dogs do. I want to see uh, the parents of these dogs, if, if they're still around, or some kind of family tree to let me know what's going on. I can't just bet a dog that's, okay, here go the parent, here go the parent, huh? This is what you're going to get. And then if somebody sell you a dream, oh, yeah, it's going to be this, this, and that. And then you go back, spend all this money on this dog, and it's the complete opposite. So I think people right. nowadays just need to do a better job of doing their research 
and uh, really a better job of buying qual more quality dogs at the end of the day. Nowadays, a lot of people, uh, they're not breeding. I mean, they're not well, breeding too. They're not breeding for the whole entire dog. Um, I think that's one reason. I, I remember H. Lee Robinson from a long time ago. I remember, I remember him from Band Dog Banner and, my, and a long time ago from the, the Band Dog message board when he first started doing this thing. And I really admire um, H. Lee Robinson program because not only he had good dogs, but he give he give you a good education on the dogs at the end of the day. He lets oh, yeah. you know exactly what these dogs are about, what you should expect, and not only with his breed, with just dogs in general. And with it and, and stuff that he could say you can you he you could apply to his program, but you could also apply to yours also. So that's why I definitely admire him and his program. And if David is she the same thing. I, I I admire those guys and their programs because they actually doing it the right way. Yeah. They breed for the whole entire dog and not just for different traits. But you okay. get a lot of people who just breed like that for that today. They just breeding for color. Like today, Merle is like the biggest oh my God. thing since sliced bread. All don't of a get me started. <laughs> right, like it's no, no, I mean, don't get me wrong. I've seen some, I've seen some really nice Merles and that, that are great working dogs. But I've also seen to that one Merle, that's a, that's a good Mastiff cross or something. I've seen a mm -hmm. hundred Merles that are just absolute trash and they'll they'll breed that to another merle thinking it's going to make big bucks and then the litter all comes out dead yep because I mean, it's it's not about the dog no more it's about the color yeah a lot yeah. of these people they you they it's it's look if a hundred like that like you say it is a few good merle working dogs out here that's put together good and real real life good dogs but there's a lot of people who had not seen the Merle bandwagon. It was like, okay, well, if I get a Merle dog, I don't care what it look like structurally wise. I don't even gotta have a temperament. But if it's a Merle color and I breed and I get Merle pups, oh, I'm gonna sell. And it's and it's so crazy that people bind into it just mm -hmm. off based off the color. They ain't showed you no proof of this dog doing nothing else but being that color, and yet. You spending three thousand dollars on a dog that that has absolutely no proof of nothing that this dude told you that this dog gonna do, besides it being the merle color that it is. So when you when you spend the money on dogs like that, you are gonna get exactly what you spend your money on. If you spend your money on dogs that ain't got no proof, you gonna get an unproven dog, and that's just exactly how it works. Right. Me personally, I work too hard. I got bills and stuff and kids to, to keep up. I can't waste money or time on on a dog that's unproven right. and i'm not and i'm not spending i'm not gonna buy a dog based off no color anyway you because it, it, it don't make sense you mean to tell me because this dog is merle he better than the black dog that came out in his litter like it, it don't make sense because you get right. breeders who they have different colors they might be three, two merles and two blacks the merle dog's going for five thousand and the black dog's going for fifteen hundred but it's it, it, what because it's a merle dog it's a better dog than the black dog no, it, 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 the color has nothing to do with nothing. It, this all it is is a, is a color. Well, mutation, should I say? That's 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 all it is. It has mm -hmm. nothing to do with the attitude of the dog, the workability of the dog, the the, the, the form, the fuck. Nothing. It, it's literally just a color. Right. And people go crazy and insane over that, and forget that it, your dog is more than the color at the end of the day. Well, let me ask you this. Um, now I, I now. As far as breeding is concerned, I wouldn't breed mm -hmm. directly for color, but I do have my colors that I like. Oh what yeah, are, I do too. What are what are yours? Uh, everything that's in my program, basically. Um, the brindles, uh, the red, the mahogany, uh, and the mahogany brindle. Um, I like the blue brindle dogs, and I like all black. That's pretty much what you're gonna get out of my program on a consistent basis. I those are, and all black. I get all black also. But those are the colors that I want. And, and you know, at the end of the day, those are the colors that come in the, within the breeds that I use at the same time, too. Every dog breed that I pretty much use come in those colors. So that's why I'm pushing these colors so hard at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. um, if I got some that was crazy out the blue, I probably still wouldn't, I wouldn't even keep the dog because these are the, are the colors, uh, genetics that's based into my breed. If I Say if I popped out a, a Merle dog, it ain't going to stay here. I'm going to get rid of it because that's not what I'm breeding for. Even if it is a good dog, whatever like that, I just, I'm just not into the Merle dogs. I'm into what I got, what I got and the, and, and the colors, uh, standard, the whole nine. I don't want to switch nothing up. 
I want to keep everything the way that it is. Everything been going good, and that's the way I, I want to keep it. But like I said, it's just me personally. Okay. And all the money that I get for the dogs go right back into them at the end of the day. Dog food, vaccines, uh, kennels, and stuff like that, it goes right back into the dogs. Like, I got a pretty decent job. I make pretty decent money, so I'm not doing this to get rich at the end of the day. And anybody that know when you're breeding dogs and you're doing it the right way, it ain't no quick get rich game, no way. <laughs> you put you put a lot of money into these dogs, and you really only get a small percentage back. So, right, yeah, very cool. Mm-hmm. So, what is the future for Colossal Mastiff? Um, I really just want. I I really want it to be the next like go to Mastiff. Like when you you see people, so many people they want bigger dogs. And that's why you see so many people getting corsos and presses and borables and stuff like that. Instead of people going to get those corsos and presses and borables, I want people to go like, oh, I want me a Colossal Master because they're, li- they're more consistent. Um, they got a better family orientation. They are actually real protection dogs without you, ha- uh, without you having to install the protection into them. They naturally got it in them. If mm-hmm. you if you want to enhance it, that's fine. If you and, and all of the hands is just controlling it at the end of the day, but the protection instinct is already naturally inside. It's naturally in these dogs. I just led well, this year. I just had two uh, back-to-back litters. Um, the one off my female Zara and another one off my female Kessler. Uh, I end up keeping a male and a female from uh, each litter. And right now they're doing exceptionally good. The people that I sold dogs to hit me up pretty much every day. Uh, talking about how smart the dogs are, um, how protective the dogs are. I, I got people that, I got one guy in Iowa, his name Ryan. Uh, he had rock rollers and Malinois before he got a dog from me. And uh, so I'm, in, in my head, you know, I'm just like, dang, I wonder what uh, my dog is, what he gonna think of my dog? Uh, since he had Rock Rollers and Malawash, you know, those are some pretty good uh, protection dogs and well-known protection dogs at that. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. That uh, the world know at the end of the day. Right. So he got the dog for me. And, uh, man, after a few weeks, months, he was ca- calling me. And, man, this is man, this is the best dog I've ever had in my life. And I'm like, man, really? You're like, yeah. I mean, he, and I, you, know, I, you know, I had the Rock Rollers and Malawash and stuff like that. But, man, this dog here... It's the best dog I ever had, man. He's super smart. The protection in him, it, it, it instinct is already there. I ain't really got to do so much. He protects over the family, the house, the whole night. And this is like, at this point, this dog is about, I don't know, about three, four months old. At the end, they ain't showing all this early to the point where by the next time I had my other litter, the dog ain't even get to one year old yet. They was coming back and get another one because they liked and enjoyed the dog that much. Same thing with everybody else who got a dog for me. I got another guy in Pennsylvania who had bullies and everything else, and he got he got one. He came back and got another one. Same situation. A couple of months later, came back and got another puppy because he enjoyed that dog so so much. It's like, man, this is the best thing that I ever had. To the point where now he want to become a colossal master breeder. He don't even want to mess with no other breed or no corsos or none of that. He want to go straight colossal master and. That's really that's what his that's his plan. He said he's gonna get ten of them and he's gonna start him a whole program. So like that lets you know that the dogs are and it's just not me talking because I'm trying to promote my dog and be like, Oh yeah, I got the best thing out here. No, I don't. I don't have the best dog out here, but I do have one of the best dogs out here. One of uh, oh a great dog, should I say, to offer to the world at the end of the day. Right. This is a real life functional um working family oriented dog that not only got those traits it's a nice looking dog too so if you're a person who want to get the a person who just wants the looks and like oh man he got a nice looking dog it also brings that aspect to the game too it's a nice looking just all around good dog and that's what i bred these dogs to be for so long at the end of the day and now i mean i ain't gonna say now like it's just starting to happen but now it's 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 starting to be more and more consistent and more and more uh to what I always wanted to get to at the end of the day, more and more towards the end game, should I say. Mm-hmm. 